So today we will be reading from Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, indeed the whole chapter. And what we will glean from this particular scripture is that God is concerned with all nations, not just Israel. That indeed God does hear his people, that is, the people who believe in him. God will relent judgment on those who repent, tribes, nations, that recognize him as the one and almighty. Now, probably one of the more famous stories, popular Old Testament stories, is about Jonah being swallowed by a large fish. In some stories, they refer to it as a whale. But in the Bible, it's a fish. And the series of events in the first two chapters of the book are of Jonah not obeying God, about his refusal to go where God wants him to go and deliver God's message. And God directed Jonah to go to Nineveh to deliver his message, God's message. Now you might say, well, that's no big deal. I mean, hey, we're supposed to obey God. We're supposed to do what he says and go where he tells us to go. But as we know, it's not always easy to deliver a hard message, especially to people who don't want to hear it. especially when it's an unpopular message with a group of people or tribe or nation even. But as always the case, we need to correct and connect, excuse me, connect with the historical defense of that day to get a really good idea of what he was facing and the impact on our main character in this story. It is believed that this event took place around 760 B.C. And there's no love lost between the Israelites and the Assyrians. Nineveh would become the capital of the Assyrian Empire. It's also known back in the biblical days as a blood city, wickedness. It is now, it's, it's, it is now located in what we call, what we refer to as Mosul, northern Iraq. It's on the eastern bank of the Tigris River, which means it's not an easy trip. It's not an easy trip for Jonah back in the day, sort of, so to speak. And Jonah's message to the Assyrian people is well timed, because at that time in Nineveh, they were going through you know, a crisis, famine. People were revolting against the empire. And we know now that you know, the Assyrians eventually overtook northern, what we refer to today as northern Israel, the kingdom of Judah in 721 B.C. Now what I'd like you to do when we read this is imagine being sent to a place that you don't like. Every one of us has a place that we don't like to go to, or some place that we've been <laughs> that we don't want to go back to. So keep that thought right here, right in front of your mind as we read this. So, we'll go to chapter 3, verse 1. Now I hear the word of the Lord. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. 
Then he issued a proclamation by the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Verse 10. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. So saith the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. So, you read this, and what struck me was it's so uncommon. It's so uncommon to have, well, a city, a whole city, 120,000 people go through the events of genuine, immediate, and serious repentance upon the announcement from the prophet. In most cases, prophets are, well, run out of town, even killed. You know, and, and, and Jonah goes into Nineveh, and it actually, it's, the Syrians are the enemy, right? And they could have killed him. Israelites would be like, well, hey, what do you expect? You go to Nineveh, you're going to be killed. And the Ninevites had every right to say, well, who are you? Who are you coming here, giving us this message? They had every right to say that. And you look at Hosea in the Bible. He counsels the Israelites to repent and receive the Lord's forgiveness. They didn't. You look at Joel. He used similar language that we see here in verse 9. There was no overwhelming repentance by Israelites. Amos mourned continuously at a Jewish nation, stubborn, prideful, refusal to repent. And even Jesus Christ lamented over Jerusalem and how it refused the prop prophets in, in the past. It refused him even. In Matthew, Jesus says, How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings? And ye would die. Ye be in Jerusalem. And of all the twelve minor prophets in the Old Testament, Jonah had it relatively easy. He had it relatively easy when it came to saying the actual message the Lord gave him. Eight words. Eight words. That's all he said. That's all he had to say. Yet forty days in Nineveh shall be overthrown. Again, we see that theme of 40 days, right? In the, in, in, in biblical, in the biblical theme. So I jumped ahead a little bit. Be excited. Um, back up to verse 1 and verse 2. The important word here is again. Again, the Lord tells Jonah, rise, go to Nineveh. Again. This is after everything he tried to get away from, being in a fish for three days and three nights. See, the Spirit of God is unrelenting. It's unrelenting. You know, God often shows up in those inconvenient times, does he not? Mm -hmm. When we really don't want him to show up. And the Holy Spirit gnaws at you, that voice in the back of your head telling you, consistently, knocking on that door. In verse 3, it's his three days journey in breath. Meaning it took Jonah three days to cover the city completely. It's a huge city. So he hit every nook and crevice of the city that he could to deliver God's message. In fasting and wearing of sackcloth, we see in verse 5, it's the ancient demonstration of mourning, right? That they were serious about this. And it's important to note that in the Hebrew text, in the Hebrew translation, 
how this is written, the first word is aman, A-M-A-N. That means believe. You start the sentence out meaning believe, to trust, to have faith. Meaning the Ninevites suddenly believed in God when they heard the warning. We see the king of Nineveh in verse 6 did the same thing. He actually found out later than the public did. But he stopped what he was doing and issued the proclamation to all people, all livestock were to fast. He said, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Notice he didn't say, well, if it's not too much trouble, or if you have the time, or if it's not too convenient. He didn't call upon his nobles to come together and debate about it. He did exactly what many of his public people did. Stop. Dire potential consequences call for immediate dire actions. Dire potential consequences calls for dire actions. You know, as we gather today and Sunday, churches all throughout America, groups, National Day of Prayer. And you can say what you want about our president, I get it, but at least he's got the wherewithal to call for a National Day of Prayer during a crisis. Invoking God, the power of prayer. You know, some people were laughing or comments on Twitter. Studying the Bible, do you know that God does give up on people? God will give up on people. God will give up on nations. The Bible also tells us God will give up on people to their own lusts of their own hearts, dishonorable passions. We see this in Romans. He'll give them up to their own debased minds. So you get to choose which way you want to walk, with God or against Him. It's not that middle turning lane, you know? <laughs> not a wide breath in the middle lane. Walk against him and only call on him in times of crisis. In Proverbs 126, it says, God will laugh at your calamity. This is a warning to those who ignore his counsel, spit on his word, living their own way, thinking that they're smarter than God. In verse 9, we see that the king of Nineveh says, who knows? God may turn and relent from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. And so many people are so quick to blame God during the crisis or when things get tough or things go wrong. Things go the way that they don't think they should, should go that way. God's mean. Instead of looking at yourself, looking at what's going on, looking in the mirror, looking inside, observing what sins are being committed, and how simple behaviors re result in desperate times, not only individually, but also nationally. It's much easier to point blame instead of taking responsibility for ourselves. I know that in this book, God saves. It's a thing throughout this whole Bible. God saves. God loves us. But he hates sin. He cannot tolerate sin. Think about something that you hate. You cannot tolerate it. God is the same way. You cannot exist with evil. God is good. God is pure. God is perfect. In order for us to be in God's favor, we must repent of our sins and recognize him as the one and only. No other way. God says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Heal their land. Second Chronicles 7.14 
And finally, in verse 10, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them. And he did not do it. See, God loves. He wants to give you blessings. But he can, if you choose, sin over him. And Jesus Christ is our high priest. He's our high priest in heaven. He's our representative. He knows the struggles, the human struggles that we go through. He's lived it. And God sent his only son to die for us. He loves us. And the real question is, will we love him back? Will we give him? Love him back as a nation, also. And so it starts with each and every one of us, each and every individual. That's the question. It's for us to decide. We trust and obey. It's the only way to be happy and content. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I pray for the nation. I pray for all of the people. The people that believe in you and those who do not. I pray that this nation will be, continue to be one nation under God. And that we should show you the respect that you deserve. And that you are there when we go into crisis there when we come out of crisis. And let us not forget you ever. In Jesus Christ's holy name, I pray.